in the room or uh, online via Teams, uh, you're very welcome. Um, so our speaker today really should need no introduction. Uh, local talents, uh, <laughs> Dr. Andrew Holmes, uh, just very briefly introduce him for anyone who may not uh, know him. Andrew is, is reader in history here in Queen's University, Belfast, specialist in the history of religion uh, in Ireland, especially uh, from the uh, late 17th century to the, the present, uh, but most intensely in, in the period of the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, he's the author of, of a number of, uh, of books, including The Irish Presbyterian Mind, Conservative Theology, Evangelical Experience and Modern Criticism, 1830 to 1930, published in 2018. And before that, The Shaping of Ulster Presbyterian Belief and Practice, 1770 to 1840, uh, published also by Oxford University Press in 2006. Uh, and most recently, he's been the co-editor uh, of a very large project, four edited volumes, sorry, it's been co-edited of four edited volumes, but also uh, one very large volume, the Oxford Handbook of Religion in Modern Ireland, which came out with Oxford uh, earlier this year. And he's going to talk to us uh, uh, about a project he's currently working on, um, which you can see here on the screen, the Northern Revival, Presbyterians and the second series of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology, 1894 to 1911. So, Andrew. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Peter, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. And thank you for turning up and for all, of the, all, all those online uh, as well. Um, this is, in some ways, a wee bit of a vanity project because it's going back to um, my experience as a PhD student many years ago, uh, reading through the Ulster Journal of Archaeology um, and finding out all sorts of wonderful things. And with the Research last semester, I was able to go back uh, and have a look again at particularly the second series of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology to try to think about uh, the politics of culture that was expressed in that periodical in the late 19th and early 20th century and how that might help us think uh, or rethink perhaps uh, the relationship between um, what was going on in cultural terms and the politics of the north of, uh, of Ireland. So um, to help us sort of like situate ourselves in terms of, of these issues, um, discussion of the Gaelic revival in the Irish Ireland movement in Ulster has concentrated on the small number of Protestants who rejected their unionist and evangelical upbringing and embraced various forms of Irish nationalism and separatism. For Flan Campbell, these individuals articulated the authentic dissenting voice of Ulster Protestants. Most of their Presbyterian co-religionists in particular had turned apostate by rejecting the Republican separatism of the 1790s to accept instead the bigotry and sectarianism of what he referred to as Tory unionism. Individuals such as Henry Cook Morrow, Gerald McNamara, uh, Robert Lind and Samuel John Waddell, Rutherford Mayne, defined themselves against a Philistine and materialist culture that was a product of Northern prosperity and Presbyterian Puritanism. Coupled with the cultural analysis of Matthew Arnold, their analysis has fostered, according to Norman Vance, crude stereotypes of unionist mercantilist philistinism, I think I've got that right, durly practical, unimaginative northerners, and killjoy Calvinists suspicious of literature as of life itself. This analysis was also, I think, importantly shared by culturally aware middle class unionists in Belfast. They believed in the mid to late 19th century that the so-called Athens of the North had succumbed to materialism and been transformed by sectarian riots into a modern Thebes. Furthermore, the prosperity of the Northeast was a critical factor in the so-called Ulsterization of unionism after 1900. By the time of the formation of the state of Northern Ireland, unionism had, according to Alvin Jackson, been reduced to a Northern bourgeois movement, and I quote, with the complex cultures of Southern landed unionism now dismissed and isolated. Jackson goes on to say, the wholly inadequate governing theme of the new state derived from a celebratory narrative of the 17th century plantation, rather than a balancing counterpoint to the motifs of Catholic Gaeldom and Irish Irelandism. The dominant Protestant nationalist in Ulster was Francis Joseph uh, Bigger. The Bigger family originally were from Scotland, and Bigger himself was identified as such by contemporaries and by subsequent commentators. In fact, Bigger was a devoted member of the Church of Ireland, 
and in 1900 was one of the prime movers in the formation of St Peter's Parish in North Belfast, and later in life was a regular attender at St Anne's Cathedral and St George's in High Street. Bigger was a clearly devoted member of the Church of Ireland and especially identified with its strong antiquarian tradition, most obviously symbolised by uh, Sir uh, Samuel Ferguson. Such was Bigger's public profile that he has been described by Guy Biner as the quintessential Irish antiquarian of his generation. His name is especially associated with the revival in 1894 of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology, which he edited and is usually mentioned in the context of his cultural nationalism. In many respects, the narrative developed above is accurate and satisfying, yet it is also misleading at certain <clears throat> points. Specifically, it relies upon an inaccurate stereotypes of Presbyterian religion and culture. Most Presbyterians did not rebel in 1798, and those who did had mixed motives that ranged from principled republicanism to the settling of old scores with Church of Ireland landlords. In the century after 1798, Guy Biner has demonstrated the Presbyterians of all theological stripes took pride in the United Irish forefathers, despite the development of orange populism and Tory politics. The best efforts of Henry Cook on the screen to convince his fellow Presbyterian evangelicals to make peace with the conservative politics and their Church of Ireland enemies failed as most ministers remained politically liberal and opposed to Anglican ascendancy. The opposition of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland to Home Rule was shaped by a liberal version of unionism that feared the replacement of an Anglican ascendancy in the late 18th century with a Rome Rule version in the late 19th. More generally, the coalition against Home Rule, as Alvin Jackson has pointed out, was held together by a shared commitment to the maintenance of Ireland within the United Kingdom. Apart from that constitutional imperative, it was a coalition divided by social, economic, geographical, cultural and denominational tensions. Yet the political significance of intra-Protestant tensions after 1880 have been underplayed, especially those concerning the land question and Presbyterian underrepresentation in public life. These were articulated by that uh, renegade T.W. Russell and also the Presbyterian Unionist Voters Association and led to often bitter election uh, contests in the Presbyterian heartlands of Antrim and Down between 1898 and 1910. These conflicts demonstrated deep-seated Presbyterian frustration with the Church of Ireland that was as much about class as denominational identity. This talk uh, hopes to challenge the binary interpretation of culturally engaged Protestant nationalists on the one hand and an undifferentiated and uncultured unionist uh, other on the other. It does so by describing the involvement of unionists, particularly Presbyterians, in antiquarianism and the relaunch of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology. It demonstrates how middle-class Protestants from various religious and political backgrounds found in the journal a platform to indulge their, share, their passion for the historical and cultural complexity of Ulster and Ireland. Focusing especially on Presbyterians, it shows their commitment to excavating Ulster's deep past as an expression of Irish patriotism and provincial pride, but also because of their intrinsic interest in the subject. That all of them were unionists underlines the need, I think, to question simplistic stereotypes and to consider how cultural and antiquarian pursuits could potentially provide common ground in an increasingly fractious political environment. The first part of my talk describes the origins and revival of the Ulster Journal. It places Bigger's contribution in perspective by drawing attention to broader associational culture and the significance of other individuals, most notably his co-editor, Robert McGill Young, his father, Robert Young, and William Swanston. The second section then will consider those who contributed substantial articles to the journal between 1893 and 1911. It introduces contributors from both ends of the Presbyterian theological spectrum who wrote articles on topics ranging in time from the Mesolithic to the contemporary. The final section then highlights the continued tension between Church of Ireland and Presbyterian interpretations of the Ulster past. Significantly, these tensions were not caused by contemporary politics or by the memory of 1798, but bigger sensitivity to Presbyterian special pleading at the expense of his own communion. The 19th century saw a proliferation of clubs and societies across the United Kingdom 
that catered for the needs and interests of the ever-growing urban middle class. Ulster was not the exception. And because of their middle class profile, Presbyterians were well represented. Interest in antiquarianism was channeled through the Belfast Society for Pro Promoting Knowledge and its Lynn Hall Library, the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society founded in 1821, and the more practically orientated Belfast Naturalist Field Club formed in 1863. At the same time, Presbyterians further developed their own history, most notably in James Seton Reid, he's the guy on the left, and his three volume history of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Reid offered an interpretation of the 17th century origins and development of Presbyterianism that foregrounded the Presbyterian struggle for civil and religious liberty against persecution, a word that comes up a lot in Presbyterian discourse by the Church of Ireland. His history was also a powerful stimulus to evangelical reform within the largest Presbyterian group, the Synod of Ulster, that led in 1840 to the creation of the present day Presbyterian Church in Ireland. A key moment in that process was the expulsion in 1829 of a small number of individuals who rejected the necessity of subscribing doctrinal statements of faith and who in many cases have developed a form of anti-Trinitarianism known as Arianism. From this tradition of non-subscription came the gentleman on the right-hand side of the screen, the Reverend George Hill, Minister of Balamoney and Crumlin from 1837 to 1850 and Librarian of Queen's College Belfast until his retirement in 1880. Hill is best known for his published work on the Montgomery's of Grey Abbey, the McDonald's of Antrim, and the Ulster Plantation. All were based on impeccable research and primary sources, including the recently published Calendar of State Papers, Ireland. Reed and Hill were part of the renewal of organized interest in the Irish past around the middle of the 19th century, the most significant product of which was the Kilkenny Archaeological Society. Founded in 1849, this society became in 1890 the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland and the various iterations of its journal provided an all-Ireland forum for antiquarians. The publication in 1853 of the first series of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology was part of this broader phenomenon and aimed to preserve as much of the provincial past as possible from the ravages of modernization. It was edited from 1853 to 1862 by another non-subscribing Presbyterian, the linguist Robert Shipboy McAdam. In addition to Hill and McAdam, there were articles by the Irish language scholar John O'Donovan, the historians of Belfast, George Benn and William Pinkerton, uh, Father James O'Laverty, author of the invaluable five volume and historical account of the Diocese of Down and Connor, and William Reeves, a leading authority in early Irish Christianity and future Church of Ireland Bishop. All these contributors were name checked in the prospectus for the relaunch of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology in 1894. The second series had the same aim as the original journal, though the urgency was added by the accelerating pace of economic and social change. The journal would provide, according to the uh, conductors, an outlet for the researches and discoveries of the present race of historical and antiquarian students and would cover a very wide range of topics from the prehistoric remains to the 1798 rebellion. Despite this potential for serious disagreements, the editors made it clear that they would, and I quote, exclude all matter tending to excite controversies on present questions of religion and politics and expected that their contributors would loyally acquiesce in this peace-preserving arrangement. Whatever their religious and political views, contributors could, and I quote, only appear as archaeologists, as sober-minded students of the past, whose contributions were expected to be absolutely trustworthy and based on facts gleaned from original sources and through scientific research. The chair of the preliminary meeting to relaunch the journal on the 24th of May, 1894, was the Reverend Charles Scott, rector of St. Paul's Church of Ireland in Belfast and an authority in early Christian Ireland. Bigger and Scott were joined by their co-religionist, Lavins Matheson Yurt, a wealthy linen merchant. In addition, there were three Orthodox Presbyterians, William Swanston, Robert Young and Robert McGill Young. All six of the original uh, conductors lived in respectable North Belfast, and the first three meetings were held in Ardree, Bigger's um, um, home, Chichester Park, the home of the Youngs, and Cliftonville Avenue, 
where William Swanston lived. The co-editor of the journal until 1898 was Robert McGill Young, and he was joined on the, on the committee by his father, Robert Young, a uh, gentleman in the middle at the top. Both were members of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, liberal unionists, and principal architects to their denomination. As a young civil engineer in the glens of Antrim, Robert Young was captivated by traditional music. He later donated to the Lynn Hall Library his own music notebooks and the minutes of the Belfast Harp Society formed in 1808. Robert McGill Young was named after his maternal grandfather, the Reverend Robert McGill of Antrim, a staunch Presbyterian evangelical and opponent of the Arians in the 1820s. After graduating from Queens in 1877, Robert McGill joined the family firm and extended his father's antiquarian and cultural interests, culminating in his election as member of the Royal Irish Academy in 1891, three years before Bigger. He's especially known as the historian of Belfast and had published in 1892, as you'll see on the screen, the Town Book of the Corporation of Belfast. Joining Young's as secretary of the journal was William Swanston, partner in the linen firm of Swanston and Bones, and a devoted member of Duncairn Congregation in North Belfast. Swanston's main interest was geology and the collection of fossil graptolites, for which he was elected fellow of the Geographical Society. He also co-founded the Ulster Fisheries and Biological Association, was the first honorary secretary of the Belfast Naturalist Field Club, and served as president of the Ulster Amateur Photographic Society. Politically, Swanston was described as an ardent unionist. He was later president of the Cliftonville Unionist Club and was active in the Ulster Volunteers. When the first edition of the journal appeared in January 1895, the number of its conductors had risen to 12. Five were members of the Church of Ireland, three Presbyterians, two Methodists, a Unitarian and a Baptist. All were from the commercial and professional upper middle classes. Ten were members of the Belfast Society for Promoting Knowledge, including the president from 1903 to 13, Robert Young. The Scottish-born Andrew Gibson, a member of Antrim Road Baptist Church, was an authority on Alan Ramsay and Thomas Moore, and gave to the Lynn Hall Library in 1901 his invaluable collection of 782 distinct editions of the work of Robert Burns. All but McChesney and Scott were members of the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society. Eight were members of the Belfast Naturals Field Club, six of whom became president. Only Yurt and Swanston were not members or fellows of the Royal Society of Antiquaries, and both Seton Milliken and Robert McGill Young served as vice presidents. Six were elected members of the Royal Irish Academy. W.H. Patterson, William Gray, uh, Seton Milliken, R.M. Young, John Vinicombe, and F.J. Bigger. The nationalist Bigger was a prime mover in the Fashion of Glen, uh, which was set up in 1904, and was a vice president of the Gaelic League in Belfast, when it was informed in, 19, uh, in 1895. So too were the unionists, W.H. Patterson and Robert Young, who's also involved in the 1908 fish, along with Charles Scott. Obituaries noted that when they died within a year of each other in the late 1890s, Levinson Yurt was ever ready to assist the cause of unionists, while McChesney was, in addition, a member of the Orange Order. Though the father of the advanced nationalist Alice Milligan, with whom he had a loving relationship and jointly produced glimpses of Aaron in 1889, Seton Milligan was, and I quote, always a convinced unionist and spoke warmly about Methodist missionary work in Ireland. Despite the enthusiasm of the conductors, the minute book of the meetings of the conductors show that the journal from the outset faced significant problems. The payment of subscriptions led to the distribution of a circular as early as August 1896 and a plea for additional subscribers in 1900. There were problems with the printers and three firms would publish the journal during its existence. Marcus Ward and Company to 1898, McCall, Stevenson and Orr to 1907 and Davidson and McCormick to 1911. Questions over who, who owned the journal were raised in 1898 and 1901 and it was only in 1907 that Bigger was formally recorded as a registered owner of Stationers Hall. These uh, general difficulties were accompanied by tensions between Bigger and Robert McGill Young. In 1895, Swanston noted that Bigger's name had been placed before Young in the first published volume. In 
Bigger said this was simply because lists were to be alphabetized, but the unanimous view of the conductors was that this did not apply to the editors and that Young's name should be placed before Bigger. In the same meeting, Young also expressed dissatisfaction that Bigger had not submitted articles in editorial matter to him and was, and I quote, in some measure ignoring the joint editorship. Bigger, in response, regretted that Young should, and I quote, feel slighted and denied any intention of ignoring him. However, tensions also emerged about the ownership of the papers of Robert Shipboy McAdam, the editor of the original Ulster Journal of Archaeology. In 1898, Young edited for publication an article that had been submitted to the first series and was contained in the McAdam papers. Young claimed that these papers had been placed in his personal possession by McAdam's daughter. Several of the conductors, however, strongly argued that the papers were held on their behalf by Young, but the matter dropped in August 1898 when Young refused to back down. Shortly afterwards, Young stepped down as co-editor and the journal became increasingly seen as Bigger's personal project from that point onwards. So what about the contributions uh, to uh, the second series of the Ulster uh, Journal of Archaeology? Uh, you can see from this uh, table that um, using the 1901-1911 census, evidence uh, from the journal itself and also uh, various biographical uh, sources. I've, able, I've been able to track down uh, the majority, the religious background of the majority of those who contribute to uh, the journal uh, during its uh, lifetime. Uh, you can see that the long dominance of Church of Ireland uh, writers and antiquarian circles was maintained in the second journal of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology. Six articles indeed were contributed by William Reeves, um, not from beyond the grave, but uh, uh, possibly anyway, while 19 were submitted by clergy and 29 by lay members of the denomination. Bigger alone contributed 87 of those uh, substantial articles. Both ends of the Presbyterian theological scholars were well represented. Uh, Unitarians and non-subscribers, including George Hill, contributed in any topics. The most distinguished was the Reverend Alexander Gordon. And I should uh, just say at this point that the, the two photographs uh, I have here are taken from a wonderful uh, website uh, run by David Steers, a non-subscribing minister called the Velvet Hummingbee, which is an absolute goldmine of any information uh, about uh, non-subscribers. And I gratefully acknowledge uh, his website in, in this regard. But the gentleman on the left is the Reverend Alexander Gordon, who had been minister of First Congregation in Belfast from 1877 before his appointment in 1889 as the principal of the Unitarian College in Manchester. The English-born Gordon was probably the most eminent and highly regarded historian of nonconformity of his times and was responsible for, and I'm not exaggerating, 778 separate articles in the original Dictionary of, Art, of National Biography. Also born in England was the gentleman in the middle, the Reverend William Sunderland Smith, Minister of Crumlin, whose contributions on the 1798 rebellion to the first two volumes of the UGA have been thoughtfully discussed by Guy Biner. Yet Smith's broader interests were reflected in articles on Suterians, the records of the Antrim Presbyterian Church, and two articles on that wonderful subject of Presbyterian handbells. The designer of the prospectus, John Vinicom, was another non-subscriber born in England, who had made his name for himself in Ireland as an engraver, illuminator, and heraldic designer. <clears throat> Reflecting his professional artistic expertise, Finnicum contributed well illustrated articles on the seals and armorial insignia of Ulster Towns, as well as the Speaker's Chair and Mace of the Old Irish House of Commons. He also wrote, and this is where this wonderful um, image is uh, taken from, uh, articles on the arms of the bishoprics of Ireland with John Ribton Gaston, who described himself in the 1911 census as Church of Ireland Anglo-Catholic. Other prominent lay non-subscribers included father and son John Mitchell Dixon and Charles Dixon. Among the articles contributed by Dixon Sr., um, whose middle name was named after John Mitchell, who was a maternal uncle, uh, were a number on ethnology that were critical of the so-called Malaysian myth of Irish origins 
and traced party spirit in Ulster, not to the 17th century, but to what he described as, and I quote, a racial antipathy of a more ancient and radical nature. Dixon Jr. was a distinguished medical practitioner and author of a monograph on the 1798 rebellion in Ulster, published in 1960. And he himself contributed two articles to the journal on prehistoric tombs. Those belonging to the Presbyterian Church in Ireland contributed a steady stream of articles on a range of topics, including many who were involved in the production of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology itself. Reflecting his lifelong interest in traditional music, Robert Young's article on the Belfast Harpers Festival of 1792 aimed to inform readers, and I quote, how the ancient melodies of Ireland were rescued from oblivion by the patriotic work of our townsmen. The printer, inventor, antiquary, and author John Stevenson published the journal between 1900 and 1907 as one of the proprietors of McCall, Stevenson, and Orr. Perhaps best known for his work, Two Centuries of Life and Down, published in 1920, Stevenson was a lifelong Presbyterian and member of the congregations of May Street and Fisherwick, of which he was clerk of session. Other Presbyterian articles contribute a whole series of uh, articles and aspects of local history. William Swanson, for instance, on maps of Carrick Fergus, Thomas Cammock on Derry Keegan in North Antrim, Annie K. Morrison and Samuel Douglas Little on Mahara in County Londonderry, and William Fee McKinney of, Corn, uh, of uh, Century Hill on the Old Session Book of Corn Money. Albert Alexander uh, Campbell, um, whose book plate you can see at the bottom of the screen, also contributed many articles and was a well-known Belfast solicitor. His wide-ranging interests across local history and historical bibliography were reflected in his various contributions. Originally from County Tyrone, Campbell was described as a staunch Presbyterian, an elder and honorary secretary of St. John's Newton Breda. He was a founder member of the Bibliographical Society of Ireland, as well as a member of the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society and governor of the Lynn Hall Library. As honorary secretary of the Belfast Natural Steel Club, he is responsible for the launch in September 1925 of the Irish Naturalist Journal and an official history of the club published in 37. Campbell's interest in historical bibliography was shared by William Clark Robinson, um, whose uh, work you can see on the right hand side. He contributed an article on the Ulster novelist James McHenry. Educated initially in Belfast, Robinson went to Bonn to study German literature and language in the same class as the future Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was lecturer at the University of Durham and Kenyon College, Iowa, before returning to Ulster, where he published British Poets of the Revolution Age in 1900, and also a collection of poems, Andrum Idylls, published in 1907. He was a member for many years of Cornlock Presbyterian Church and was also an ardent orange, uh, orangeman. Representing the reformed or covenanting tradition was the Reverend Samuel Ferguson, a minister in Derry and grandson of the late 18th century radical, the Reverend William Staveley. Ferguson's article in the Norman Fort of Greencastle in Inishowen was part of his significant contribution to the history of Derry and its surroundings. Indeed, Bigger praised Ferguson's 1902 lecture on the waterside area of the city as something of a model antiquarian paper, and I quote, learned, broad-minded, unbiased, and free from taint of bigotry. Another 13 articles were contributed by John Johnson Marshall, a native of Tyrone, who was a drapery buyer for Robinson and Cleaver in Belfast. Marshall published in the local history of both locations and was an authority on the history of the valley of the River Blackwater. He also contributed a series of articles, which you can see extracts from on the screen, in 1904-05 on the dialect of Mid-Ulster. He hoped that his um, uh, articles would show the twofold origin of the dialect in, and I quote, the native Gaelic and the lowland Scottish speech of so many of the plantation colonists. In comparison to the other provinces, Ulster's speech was, and I quote, more abrupt and decisive, taking its tone from the character of its people. <laughs> this earnestness and sincerity of character, at least that's the positive spin on it, led to a tendency to clip letters or syllables where possible off words. As an example, Marshall noted the treatment by Ulster people of the terminal G, which he seems to regard as altogether unnecessary and superfluous, and to be omitted whenever possible from his coming into the world till his dying day. Marshall hoped to create a dictionary of the Ulster dialect that would unite the inhabitants of Ulster at home and overseas, and I quote, 
through whose veins courses the mingled blood of the clansmen of O'Donnell and O'Neill, the adventurers of the days of Elizabeth, who sought their fortune in Irish soil, and the Covenanter, who le whose left hand held the Bible and his right hand the sword. This proposed work would be, and I quote, a fitting record of their mingled blood and speech. Marshall's attentiveness to a distinctive Ulster identity that encompassed the religious, ethnic and social variety of the province has, I think, certain affinities with John Hewitt's mid 20th century regionalism. I think it was also reflected in his fulsome obituary of Father James O'Lafferty, whose efforts to revise the Irish language and the music of the harp were, and I quote, shall ever be among the treasured memories of all true Irishmen. Presbyterian scholars also made significant pioneering and contri pioneering contributions to the study of Irish prehistory. The Reverend Dr. George Raphael Buick, Minister of Cunningham Memorial Congregation in Cullibaki and moderator of the General Assembly in 1895, wrote articles in High Crosses, a bronze bridal belt and Presbyterian communion tokens. When he died suddenly in Damascus in 1904, the Northern Whig described him as, and I quote, one of the most accomplished and patriotic sons of Ireland. Between 1883 and 1904, Buick published 12 articles in the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries on prehistoric pottery, flint arrowheads, cranogs, burial tombs, Ogham script, and Indian burial urns. He's elected a member and later fellow of the Royal Society of Antiquaries and was awarded an honorary doctorate from the Royal University of Ireland. Buick was also a published poet and his poems about St. Patrick, according to the Whig, were marked by beauty of style and high toned patriotism. For Dr. Buick was an ardent lover of his nat native land and did much to further her best interests. Buick's patriotism extended in 1894 to his appointment as vice president of the Belfast Gaelic League alongside Francis Joseph Bigger, W.H. Patterson and Robert Young. The obituary of this esteemed and eminent antiquary was written for the Ulster Journal by another Presbyterian archaeologist, William James Knowles. A land agent for the Casement Estate in North Antrim, Knowles made substantial contributions to the study of Irish prehistory through the classification of Neolithic flint, as well as identifying the porcelainite axe factory at Tave Bulla near Cushendall. Knowles, according to the Dictionary of Irish Biography, excavated more carefully and documented, documented his finds more methodically than other antiquarians at the time, and was responsible for the publication of 70 papers in learned journals. As a consequence, he was elected member of the Royal Irish Academy in 1883, and was fellow of both the Royal Society of Antiquaries and the Royal Anthropological Society. At his death in 1927, he was described as the father of Ulster antiquaries. Knowles' 11 articles to the Ulster Journal consider topics such as funeral pottery, worked flint, leather objects, domestic utensils, stone axes, cranogs, spindle whorls, and souterrains. An important feature of many was the additional information he provided about how prehistoric items were utilized by subsequent generations. For instance, Knowles noted how many work, how worked flint was used by cow doctors on cattle who had been harmed by elf shot. A similar purpose was made of polished stone axes known locally as thunderbolts. The contribution of Buick and Knowles to the study of Irish prehistory was of national importance. Other Presbyterians were content to make more modest contributions. The Reverend William A. Adams of Antrim discussed prehistoric sites in the Ormo area of South Belfast after he had been alerted to Flint artifacts on his way to the Ulster Union's convention in June 1892. Joseph Skillen, manager of the Phoenix Weaving Company in Ballymena, contributed articles in Kells Abbey and the Tomb of the O'Haras. Skillen is important because he provided a link between the second and third editions of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology that resumed in 1938. At his death in 1954, Eston Evans described Skillen as one of the founders and strongest supporters of the journal, a loyal friend who in many ways seemed to me to personify Ulster. Indeed, there is even a facial resemblance to Lord Carson. Presbyterian contributors surprisingly had a lot to say about the early modern history of Ulster, including Joseph William Kernahan, a founding member and honorary secretary of the Presbyterian Historical Society of Ireland, librarian of the Presbyterian College Belfast, and a prolific journalist. 
Yet the most con uh, notable contributor in early modern topics was the Reverend William Thomas Latimer. Latimer was minister of Eglish Congregation in County Tyrone and was described by Albert Campbell as the historian of Irish Presbyterianism. Latimer's many articles to the Ulster Journal identified the meeting place of the volunteer conventions at Dungannon in 1782, 83 and 93, covered the Williamite Wars in County Fermanagh and located the, uh, the exact uh, location of the Battle of Ben Burb in 1646. Latimer also published a two-part essay about the Kirk Session books of Dundonald Congregation in County Down to illustrate the religious practice of 17th century Presbyterians and to underline the general use, usefulness of such church records. Latimer was certainly admired by Bigger, who offered a positive review of Latimer's Ulster biographies relating chiefly to the rebellion of 1798, published in 1897. Though Latimer was a convinced unionist in the 1998 rebellion, he offered an empathetic and considered account of the motives and actions of Henry Joy McCracken and others. Reflecting his own commitment to the cause of land reform during the Victorian period, Latimer was especially sensitive to the economic motives that drove Presbyterian tenant farmers to rise against Church of Ireland landlords. Latimer contributed further articles on late 18th century Presbyterian radicals to the journal, including the last ever to appear in the second edition of uh, the second series. He offered a poignant and often moving account of the career of the Reverend William Steele Dixon after the 1798 rebellion. Relying on the charity of a few friends, Dixon died in 1824 at 80 years of age. And I quote, driven out of society, forgotten by his friends, and treated with injustice by the leaders of the church for which he had suffered least some of his many sorrows. Dixon by that stage had been buried in a pauper's grave in Clifton Street Cemetery and it was only through the efforts of my friend Francis Joseph Bigger that a suitable marker had recently been erected with the inscription in Irish for the honour of Ireland. The varied backgrounds of the contributors often made it difficult for the editors to keep everyone happy. Yet it was not contemporary politics or the memory of 1798 that caused tensions in the journal. The organised centenary of the rebellion of 1798 in Ulster was an important stimulus to the revival of militant Republican separatism and was of course given a wide berth by unionists. Yet the memory of the turnout continued to attract unionist writers such as Latimer, uh, William Sunderland Smith and Robert McGill Young. The only disagreement in the Ulster Journal between Bigger and a Presbyterian writer about the United Irishman arose in 1909 when he claimed that the Reverend Arthur McMahon was an informer, a charge that was dismissed by the Reverend David Stewart. Moreover, Bigger favourably reviewed publications by Presbyterians and was especially favourable towards the moderation of non-subscribers. Yet Bigger was very critical of what he considered Presbyterian special pleading. For instance, he objected to two supplementary chapters in Professor James Heron's 1898 study of the Celtic Church that rejected the claim of the Church of Ireland to use that title, as well as apostolic succession. According to Bigger, these were a mere wrangle about modern trifles that might have been better left for a sectarian magazine and not included in what was otherwise an excellent history. Bigger was also critical of Charles Hanna's two-volume The Scots-Irish, published in 1902. And I quote, we have no stomach for swallowing half the incredulous stories that are told of this somewhat mythical race. He asked his readers not to romance about this plantation of Ulster and rave about persecution and covenanting forefathers as if we were all seeds of the martyrs. Presbyterian immigrants, he claimed, were not angels nor even martyrs and were often ruthless in their pursuit of gain. Bigger recognised that these claims may be unpalatable but true self-knowledge was, and I quote, better than licking jam all the time. The main target of Bigger's ire was Latimer and his Presbyterian perspective in Ulster history. Bigger's criticism appeared for the first time in 1900 in a review of Latimer's history of Second Donachady Congregation. Bigger was, and I quote, tired of the systematic groaning of its suffering for conscience sake so frequently indulged in by certain denominational writers. All churches, he pointed out, had experienced hard times, 
and I quote, but why such comparatively trifling matters should be ceaselessly, ceaselessly construed into persecution is hard to comprehend. Better let such bygones be bygones. Bigger admitted that raising this issue verges on controversy, though he did so in all, he did so in all good faith and with the best of intentions. Significantly, Bigger had sent to Latimer a version of this review prior to publication, and Latimer stated that he personally did not object to it, though he considered that the journal was strictly non-sectarian. Within a year, Biggers renewed his criticism of Latimer after he had published in the Northern Whig an article with Blood's Plot of 1663, in which a number of Presbyterian ministers were implicated. Bigger was especially annoyed about Latimer's criticism of Bishop Jeremy Taylor and claimed that conspiracy to overthrow the government of Charles II was extensive amongst Presbyterians. Extending his critique, and I've put up here the full quotation because it's actually quite cool. I'm thinking of putting this on my tombstone because um, I think it, uh, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice. Bigger claimed that he had grown weary of this class of local religious history that had begun with James Seton Reid. In Bigger's opinion, and this is the good bit, a historian of the Presbyterian body need not necessarily be one with an anti-episcopal brief in one hand and a muck wreck in the other, vilifying and abusing his opponents all the time or else picking out all the personal calumnies of centuries. Latimer submitted for publication his own um, submitted for publication a response to this review that duly appeared in April 1902. Latimer was clear that Bigger was free to have his own opinions just as he had a right to his own uh, with regard to their position and principles. But again, and I quote, he said, I consider the journal is not the place to discuss questions like these, which may run into theology or politics. Latimer considered it perfectly legitimate to employ the facts to defend his position and was confident that the new edition of his history would accord with these. While this controversy was rumbling on, Bigger criticized in the grounds of bad taste Latimer's republication of Presbyterian church records. In a review of the second part of Latimer's article in the Temple Patrick Session book in the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries in 1901, Bigger could not hide his disgust at laying bare the sins of our forefathers exhibited in the cases of Sabbath breach, sexual misconduct and drunkenness brought before the Kirk Session. The system of church discipline he described as tyrannous and disgusting in the extreme. And a superficial reader could only conclude that, and I quote, every home in Ulster in 1649 was far from moral. Moreover, the descendants of many of the unfortunate delinquents still lived in the Temple Patrick area. As a consequence, this form of local history would, and I quote, have a new charm for the scandal monger, monger and afternoon tea gossiper. An added piquancy would be given to life in the Temple Patrick village circle, and the fresh shame of, yes shame of yesterday will only be, in a literal sense, history repeating itself. An article in 1903 by Bigger about Alexander Peden, the late 17th century renegade Presbyterian preacher and, and prophet, excuse me, widened the dispute beyond the pages of the Ulster Journal. Bigger concurred with Sir Walter Scott's and flattering description of the character and actions of covenanters like Peden, and that the authorities had, and I quote, ample excuses for their severe measures. Peden was described by Bigger as a raving fanatic and a regular maddy. The Northern Whig was not impressed with this wholly irrelevant article. Bigger's criticisms of Peden and the later covenanters, as well as his attempt to excuse the brutality of the authorities, are, and I quote, statements whose interest lies solely in the likely throw and the mental attitude of the writer and his respect for the deepest religious feeling of a large section of the Scottish people and their descendants in Ulster. The Whig had always supported the Ulster Journal, but, and I quote, if they expect to succeed in their task, future and present subscribers may reasonably ask for some assurance that they are subscribing to a journal of archaeology and not a magazine of sectarian controversy. The Witness newspaper, semi-official organ of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, took particular exception to the difference between the statements made by Bigger and the declared aim of the conductors to run the journal on lines that were non-sectarian and non-political. It was, according to the Witness, exceedingly bad taste for the conductors to employ the journal to glorify one church and to abuse another. 
This was echoed in the Irish Presbyterian magazine, which stated that Presbyterian subscribers were owed, and I quote, a public apology to the offensive tone, a tone assumed by the journal recently and a promise of amendment in the future. Bigger did not apologize. And in 1904 caused further controversy in a three-part article on Sir Arthur Chichester that included a discussion of the Island McGee massacre of January 1641, which had long been a staple of Catholic histories of the period. Bigger questioned the claim of Protestant writers that very few Catholics had been killed and that those who carried out the killings were not members of the regular Scottish army. Writing in the Northern Whig as fair play, Albert Campbell, who as we know contributed to the journal, rhetorically asked, and I quote, why Mr. Bigger revives this ancient slander? Is it because any stick is good enough to beat the Presbyterian dog with? This began a public exchange of correspondence that continued into August 1904. An exasperated Campbell observed in May that Bigger had, and I quote, not attempted any defense of his travesty of history and asked his readers what they were to think of, and I quote, a writer who places before the public garbled history and when brought to book has neither the grace to apologize for offensive conduct nor the manliness to confess his lack of any real knowledge of the historical subject on which he wrote. Bigger's defense in the July edition of the Ulster Journal brought forth a lengthy response from Campbell who maintained that Scottish Presbyterian soldiers could not have carried out the massacre as they only arrived in April 1641. He also referred to, and I quote, the anti-Presbyterian tone which has recently characterized the Ulster Journal. J.W. Kernahan also offered a considered response in the journal in April 1905, in which he claimed that Bigger's evidence was at best circumstantial. Just perhaps the dispute over Island McGee led to a change of tone on Bigger's part. In 1906, he favorably reviewed the Reverend Alexander G. Leckie's The Lagan and its Presbyterianism. This offered a particularly Presbyterian account of 17th century history and dwelt much on the persecution endured by Presbyterians at the hands of the Church of Ireland. Bigger and his re observed that, and I quote, the impartial historian is a myth, or at best a poor wishy-washy scribe. Let us have colour and belief in our subjects, treating fairly our foes, but never hesitating to adorn with laurels the brows of our heroes. What if, he rhetorically asked, such writers as Alexander Leckie wanted to prove that St. Colm Kill or St. Patrick were Presbyterians before the letter? Such efforts should not detract from what he said was a valuable uh, book and the kindly feeling that pervaded its pages. In 1906, the Presbyterian Historical Society was formed. The new society demonstrated the deep attachment of Presbyterians to historical and antiquari antiquarian research and was, I think, in some ways a re response to the tone that Bigger had adopted in the Ulster Journal. The society was also an exercise in Presbyterian ecumenism and involved nearly every Presbyterian who had contributed to the Ulster Journal, irrespective of their theological position. The formation of the society demonstrated that Presbyterians were fully aware of the interconnected history of Ulster and their religious tradition, a connection that had been described and explained by Presbyterian historians since the 17th century. During the Ulster crisis of 1912 to 14, this and other historical narratives were of course employed for political purposes. As the Ulsterization of unionism gathered pace after the formation of the Ulster Unionist Council in 1905, the connection between Presbyterianism, prosperity and provincial identity was a ready-made usable past. This was employed to underpin the claims of Ulster Unionists and this, what Graham Walker describes as the Presbyterianization of Unionism was most obviously demonstrated in the signing of the Ulster Covenant in September, 1912. At the same time, Bigger was becoming more outspoken in his nationalism, especially after the success of the Fession of Glen in 1905. In January 1907, for instance, he caused controversy when he used a public lecture at the Lynn Hall Library on the hills of Holy Ireland to criticise English interference in Ireland. Yet the impact of polarisation on the cultural life of middle class northerners, I think, can be overplayed. The Ulsterisation of unionism and the formation of the Presbyterian Historical Society did not stop Presbyterians from contributing to the Ulster Journal. The fact that Latimer contrib contributed the last ever article and on a Presbyterian United Irishman 
I think, is significant. Nor did it erase the Irish patriotism of Presbyterians such as W.J. Knowles, the Youngs and George Buick, whose interest was heartfelt and long-standing. The retrenchment of cultural life in the two Irelands after partition was obvious, yet it did not end the cultural pursuits of enthusiastic amateurs. John Stevenson's valuable Two Centuries of Life and Down was published in 1920. Campbell relaunched the in-house journal, uh, in journal of the Belfast Natural Steel Club in 1926, and Joseph Skillen was involved in the formation of the third series of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology in 1936. Writing in 1954, Eston Evans noted that it was from the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society and the Belfast Natural Steel Club that pioneered archaeology after partition and not the Northern Ireland state. The pioneers of scientific archaeology, as he called them, were people like Skillen, linen merchants, civil, surgeon, civil servants, engineers, doctors, teachers, university lecturers, and indeed clergymen. The priority of the Unionist government to maintain unity in Northern Ireland did produce what Alvin Jackson refers to as a deadening conformity, but this was alien to many Presbyterians who continued to criticise Craig and his ministers for failing to take seriously their concerns and their grievances. Even in the midst of polarisation and sectarianism of this period, I think antiquarianism and local history could bring together individuals from a variety of political backgrounds. Presbyterian Unionists were very much involved in these cultural pursuits and lazy stereotypes them, stereotypes them of them as dour, culturally disinterested and materialistic need at least to be qualified. Not for the first time, the obsessive focus on Protestant unity in opposition to nationalism diverts attention from the variety of Protestant experience. It also obscures what I hope I have um, um, uncovered to some degree, the significance of differences between Protestants caused by social class, political principle, and denominational identity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that. So lots to get our, our teeth into uh, there. Um, so opportunity to ask questions. Uh, people in the room, just raise your hand. Uh, people online, if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand electronically or type a question into the chat box. Um, to start with the room, anyone like to start? Good questions? Yes. Uh, was the periodical always in um, some sort of financial uh, straits? Generally speaking, yes. Um, the very fact that they had to remind subscribers to pay <laughs> as early as 1896 um, was, I think, important. Um, you can also see it in terms of the number of articles published in each of the volumes, it does go down. And um, the fact that they had to, um, well, Marcus Ward itself collapsed in 1898. And then I went to McCall, Stevenson and Orr, who were a much more profitable business. But by 1907, they weren't making anything out of it. So they gave up at that point. And then you had the third, um, uh, Davidson and McCormick coming in. So yeah, the financial problems were always, were always in, in the background. Did the Federalist dip into their pockets? Is that how the money was, was, or did it purely basically let the subscriber revenues would purely finance it? It's, it's seem, it seems to be the case that they're relying upon subscribers. Um, there, um, there was a big turnover in the conductors of the journal in about 1901, 1902. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with certain contributors not um, giving extra money to the journal and others who were involved and I thought you're a bit lukewarm you know on your way um you know so I, I, I suppose in, in many ways the remarkable thing about the journal is that it actually produced 15 volumes um and in, in many ways that is bigger's energy you know that does that but it's also a reflection of the fact that the, the topics discussed were were popular enough amongst middle class people in the north of Ireland in general that they were willing still to contribute to it. And those people came from, you know, almost every uh, part of the political and religious spectrum in the north of Ireland. Uh, so from, from that perspective, that's why I'm emphasising, you know, 
the, the journal as, as a place where people could come together to talk about these things which interested them. You know, I've, I've often referred to in the past as the Adarak quality of, of antiquarianism, you know, but there is actually something really important about that as a, as a, a means of social bonding. So yeah, thank you for your question. Well, the presence of women in the journal as authors, subjects, um, and women in unwilling subscribers? <laughs> um, generally speaking, as, as subscribers, yes. As contributors, no. Uh, there's only one female Presbyterian contributor, um, Annie. Annie, oh, sorry, I forgot her name. Uh, she contributed a joint author article on Mahara, mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly, she's listed in the in the census as a typist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I reckon it was because her her friend and male friend in Mahara didn't have those skills, so she ended up. So, <laughs> absolutely, she did. Um, there, there are people associated, women associated with the fashion of men, who do contribute articles, um, but actually not that many, um, uh, surprisingly. Um, Alice Milliken, I don't think she contributes an article, I may be wrong. Um, there are a couple of other Quaker women who contribute a couple of articles on archaeological themes, but generally speaking, no, it, it tends to be to be men that are contributing, but women are very are, are clearly involved uh, and very important in terms of subscriptions. Um, yeah, sure. Um, that was a yeah, fascinating reconstruction of what the audience actually thought about the network, but they're very Ulster networks. Yeah. Um, it, is there any inflection engagement with what's happening in the rest of Ireland with the work of people like Richard Bagwell, for example, or Alistair Green, or anyone like this? Or is this um, partition for this time? Um, to, to, some, to some degree, it is. Um, but it's also a reflection of the fact that the people involved think that Ulster has been ignored. You know, mm -hmm. so the, fa the fact that you have a nationalist like Bigger and a unionist like Young, who are uh, coming together to say we need something specifically on Ulster, I, I think speaks to that sense that they're not uh, part of, of, of this bar thing. Um, uh, th they are engaging with um, those other parts of Ireland as well. Um, so, for instance, uh, Knowles and Buick um, are really involved in the Royal Society of Antiquaries. Um, Knowles is really involved in the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, and you know, and on his death, the Royal Irish Academy praises Knowles as, as a really significant uh, contributor uh, to the archaeological understanding of Ireland. Uh, Vinicombe is based largely in Dublin, um, and he's engaging not just with with Irish networks, but because he's English himself, he's also engaging with with English networks. The fact that Knowles is elected a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Society. Uh, Swanson's elected as a fellow of the Geographical uh, Geological Society. Th these people are part of broader uh, networks and they're contributing to them, but they're they're talking to those audiences in different forums. The Ulster Journal of Archaeology is about the archaeology of Ulster, um, and I think what you get is a, 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 in some ways quite a quite an accurate sense from the journal of the variety of cultural identities in the north of Ireland, because people are writing about these things from different perspectives, um, but they're all contributing to a general sense that that Ulster has largely been ignored. Um, Bigger wants to emphasize that in terms of his nationalism <clears throat> and sort of like, you know, the fourth green field to use the, the, the Balkan sort of ideas, but the unionists are also saying actually this makes us a bit different, but not at the expense of their Irishness. And I think that's actually really important to emphasize that Knowles and Buick and Campbell and people like that are all emphasizing we're Ulstermen, but we're also Irish. Uh, and I think that's an important sort of thing to. to uh, sorry, that's a rambling answer to that. Sorry, Andrew. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if you could really touch on this. No. But uh, I just wanted, uh, if I could follow up the earlier question about women yes. contributors. I appreciate there are no women writing for the journal, but I was wondering about women in the circle of uh, F.J. Bigger uh, at Ardree. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking particularly, uh, one I've been interested in recently, Helen Waddell, yes. who I gather was a member of the circle. According to Margaret Ward, she was a member of the circle, but mm. 
she insisted that she was very apolitical. Yes. She didn't yes. want to be an Irish nationalist. Yes. On the other hand, she didn't want to be a unionist either. And she was surprisingly critical of Sir Edward Carson, very, yes. very sharp. Yes. And their criticism of Sir Edward Carson. Yeah. But I was just wondering if there were any other women who were associated with the FJ figure, apart from Alice Milligan. Oh, and, and Ethan Carberry. And people like that as well, you know. So th th there, are, there are quite a few uh, women uh, that are associated with that. I think Helen Waddell is really interesting because um, Helen Waddell challenges all those binary stereotypes that we have of the culture and political life in the north of Ireland. Um, the fact that she said she was apolitical and was interested in the stuff because she was interested in it as a, as a linguist, as a, a literary historian, uh, as somebody who's interested in the cultural life of this part of the world. Those those voices don't fit well with a nationalist unionist binary interpretation. Um, there there are other people that I was talking about there who would be what we might call small U unionist, you know, um, but who really dislike Carsonism, who really dislike the militancy of this. Um, I think that's particularly the case amongst clergy. And uh, Nicola Morris has done an excellent article in the New Hibernian Review on the, the relative uh, rates of signing by different Protestant ministers and clergy. The Church of Ireland clergy are much more likely than Presbyterian and Methodist clergy to sign the Ulster Covenant. The Presbyterian clergy, she reckons, about 50-55% of Presbyterian ministers who could sign the Ulster Covenant did. Now that did not mean that 45% were nationalists or Republicans. It meant that they were deeply worried about the moral and political implications of signing themselves to a document which they thought would then lead to taking up arms against their, their, their fellow citizens. Um, and th that type of, of, of moderate, <laughs> the prod in the garden center <laughs> stereotype in some ways, um, is actually really, culturally important, but gets completely sort of obliterated or, or airbrushed by a focus on those who are maybe at the more extreme of, of, of the things. So, sorry, that's not a, a specific answer to your question. I think Helen Waddell is a potential really helpful way to think about that in general. But in terms of the Ardree circle, there are other uh, women who are involved. But the ones that we've talked about tend to be a bit more identified as nationalist uh, uh, or, or even separatist and then their attitudes. So yeah. I hope that helps. Look, questions online? Yeah, so we have one question. Uh, Guy Byron, do you want to read? <laughs> Go ahead, Guy. Uh, Andrew, you didn't think I'd left you, leave you off the hook there, did you? Um, re really enjoyed that, really did. And, and I'd like to continue, if I, if, I, if I got the voices right in the background, with, with Sean Connolly's uh, uh, question before that or interjection before that. Um, I think you really map out remarkably this kind of moment. It's interesting the journal ends just before the covenant, right? It's this kind of remarkable mm -hmm. moment which allows different identities where the tension between regionalism and national identities are, are interplay all the time. And it's supposedly about the past, but it's all the time about the present. And it's showing all these different identities working themselves out in a way which they can, despite, like you say, despite this Presbyterian dissatisfaction, they still remain on board in the journal and they still contribute, right? Yes. But I yeah. think my impression is that we often choose the obvious way of looking at them. I and I chose the most obvious. I chose, you know, 1798. And like you say, that's not the key issue. But we look at history. And we look at modern history. Sometimes we call it early modern, but for them it was modern history, right? And that's where we see these tensions playing out. But if we want to take them seriously on their own account, and you've given a lot of pieces for that, a lot of kind of trails to follow, we need to take them exactly at archaeology, at natural history, at ethnology, mm -hmm. at all these yeah. other interests, and see yeah. how the politics play into that. It's a bit more subtle there, right? It's a bit more difficult. With history, it seems to be obvious. It's the obvious narratives. You go back to Island McGee, and you go back to kind of obvious cases. Um, but it's interesting to kind of peel bit by bit the politics behind that and how it works and how these identities work out because, you know, I often thought about Bigger's fascination with bees. Mm. 
Bees don't have a border. There's no partition for bees, right? They can't <laughs> stop it. They, they, they don't stop on any on county line. But, and, and it's this kind of notion of how they work out their identities, looking at how regionalism works out. And at the same time, they see similar artifacts when they look at the Kilkenny Journal, which later becomes the, yeah. the, the official journal. So th that's the big challenge for antiquarianism, how you kind of carve out a different archaeology. Eston Evans will sharpen it much, much more, but that'll be a different context. That'll be a context of yeah. partition. They've got much more fluidity. You know, I, I, yeah, absolutely, uh, Guy. I'm, I'm not smart enough to um, uh, understand the sort of the, the cultural politics of, of the ethnology and archaeology and natural history. Uh, and what we might call popular science in the way that you, you've described it. Um, I think there is, uh, there is, as you know, Guy, there is a huge amount of untapped source material on, on cultural pursuits in this period. You know, the, the, the um, annual reports of the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society, the Naturalist Field Club, um, all these various ephemeral societies that I mentioned in, in the paper, there's a huge amount of material there. But as, as you know, people tend to mine that for stuff about 1798 or about 1641 or whatever, but they don't look at flint arrowheads, they don't look at citrines, they don't look at Ogham or whatever it might be. Um, and I, I'm, I'm more and more sort of convinced that the binary of, of unionism and nationalism only, it, it doesn't actually, it doesn't really help us get a sense of how people actually engaged with each other on a regular basis in the various fora that we've been talking about. Um, and I can understand the focus on the constitutional question and the clash over that, but there's also another, as you say, in archaeology, a hidden history there that could be excavated in a helpful way to maybe think about the potential use of that as a way to bring uh, different uh, groups and perspectives together. Um, I'm sure you want to come back on something uh, on anything I've said there, because that's a bit of a rambling answer to your to your 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 observation. I, I, I'm, 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 okay, I'm, okay, I'm okay with that. I'm, 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 I'm okay because that's exactly the direction that needs to be explored. It's these people, and it relates also to the question of women as well, or kind of these passive yeah. voices, but they're around. It's all these different societies. Part of it, I found the reason, to, to if, I, if I recognize the voices right there, because I can't see the audience, uh, Marie Coleman's question about, about women is a pertinent one, but it's okay. also this kind of Victorian, Edwardian norms which allow, which permit women to participate in debates. They can't even read papers at these societies. They have to be read by a man. That has always surprised me. And so, you know, the, exactly the typist, you know, the, the author becomes a typist. You know, yes. it, it's this kind of notion that they, you have to find a category which, which is acceptable by these kind of uh, gender norms. But they're all members of all these different societies and they these multiple identities is part of this fluidity. And we need to take them, uh, on their own terms, meaning we need to find the the kind of the subtle politics, if you wish, exactly of the souterrains and the, and the flint heads, which fascinate them just as much as 98, probably more, actually. And, you know, they set up what will become later the, the, the original collection for the Ulster Museum. That all these antiquaries are collecting this stuff. It all begins with these societies. And so they form an, a, a regional identity which can fit within a national identity, which can fit within a British identity, and they all work together. I, I absolutely. I think it also relates to another issue, and that is the the othering of the Irish experience in this period. Um, again, to do with the constitutional question, which then means that Irish historians or historians of Ireland in general aren't particularly great at trying to place what is happening here in a broader comparative context, because what is happening with the Belfast Natural uh, History and Philosophical Society in this period of the Hall Library is the exact same thing that's happening in Germany, the exact same thing that's happening in uh, towns and cities uh, throughout uh, Britain. It's the same thing that's happening in Scandinavia. Um, so it's part of a broader cultural European uh, phenomenon, which I think, you know, and if I put this into a comparative perspective, you know, as, as you've uh, uh, have done yourself in your own work, I think that that, that point could be made much better. Okay. Um, thank you, Guy. Uh, moving back to just a question uh, on, on that, Andrew. Uh, Eston Evans came up a number of times there. Guy brought Eston Evans. 
uh, up as well. Um, obviously, he's a kind of <laughs> central foundational figure in, in uh, the, the, the institution in which we're in today. I will not speak um, of him. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't remember which year he's appointed to, to Queen's, but it, it's the mid-30s, I mm. think. He comes as, as the first lecturer in, in geography. Um, but there is a gap between the period you're talking about, uh, with, the, with the final issue of the second series in, in 1911, and then the, the reformation in 1938, and the, the arrival of Eston Evans, and the kind of re, rediscovery of regionalism within certainly the academic space uh, around Eston Evans' work and the kind of regionalist ethnography and the regionalist uh, archaeology, which he's developing and went to just had a kind of cultural significance for others. Uh, as well, but what keeps this tradition alive yeah. in in those decades between um, the Edwardian period and and the late nineteen thirties? Yeah, um, I, I think it, in some ways it's the association culture that we've been talking about. You know, the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society, the Belfast Natural Field Club. Um, the Field Club is is interesting because it's it's a bit more democratic than the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society. Um, and it's a bit more socially inclusive yeah. in, in that sense. Um, and you know, the, the good example of that is Albert Campbell, who I mentioned, um, who you know, was, was appointed one of the first vice presidents in, when it set up in the 1860s. He then launches the Irish Naturalists Journal mm -hmm. in the mid 1920s and writes the official history of the club. Like there is a guy who, sort of is interested in this throughout that period and he's connected with these various uh, associations and societies and um, some of which are quite ephemeral but which are engaging roughly the same type of people in a common uh, pursuit which is why Evans then when the Ulster Journal is reanimated in 1938 he talks about how the Northern Ireland state has got nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. It's got to do with the linen merchants and the, the, the clergy and the university lecturers who are interested in this, who have kept that flame, if you want to put it that way, alive. Um, and Evans himself is, <laughs> you know, going back to Guy's point, Evans is actually a really good way to think about um, broader non-Irish influences mm -hmm. upon, you know, the study of, of, of these um, issues. Um, I discovered that um, one of Evans' first students at Queen's was a guy called J.M. Mogi, if I pronounced that correct, M-O-G-E-Y, um, who did a, a thesis on sort of craniometry <laughs> in County Down in the 1930s, going around measuring people's uh, skulls and things like that. Um, but the external examiner for the thesis was H.J. Fleur, mm -hmm. who was one of the um, sort of like anthropologists in the, in the early 20th century. So, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Good to see some quantification <laughs> in the paper. Every now and again, I try, Liam, I try. <laughs> um, two unrelated questions. One, antiquarian materials, sometimes negative connotations in the 21st century. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on what it meant at the end of the 19th century and the other unrelated question is, did the Cruithen controversy or myth feature in any of these um, journals? Um, you can recall? Uh, to take the, the second part first, um, there are references to it in J.M. Dixon's articles in Irish Ethnology. Um, um, Yeah, so I'm aware that there are references. It's not extensive, but it is, but it is there. Um, in some ways, that sort of feeds into a, a previous narrative that focused on the so-called Kaldis, uh, the clients of God, I think is, is the, the, the transliteration of that. Um, sort of a sort of the, the, what the Celtic Church was like, and what Colin Kill and people like that. Uh, were associated with because for Presbyterians that was a way to try to link Presbyterianism as it developed in Scotland and Ireland back to the early Celtic Church. Uh, you know, so it, there there have Presbyterians in Ireland trace their origins back to the 17th century, but there's always quite a strong tradition amongst Presbyterians in Scotland and Ireland about trying to trace that back further, and the Cruthen and the Caldees and things like that are part of that possibly alternative tradition. 
uh, within Presbyterianism. So, sorry, that's a long-winded way of, of addressing your second point. The first uh, point was about... Oh, how someone at the end of the 19th century would have yeah, yeah. Um, understood the term antiquarian. Yeah, I, you're right. Antiquarian is a pejorative now. You know, it's a term that you use to describe somebody who is a bit, who addresses a popular audience, who maybe doesn't have the, the, the craft skills of a professional scholar. Um, and I suppose antiquarian is quite a useful label to, to talk about those enthusiastic amateurs, I'm, I'm not even, well, I'm a, amateurs I think in the literal sense is the way to describe it, of people who take their studies incredibly seriously, but aren't part of a, of a, of a guild, aren't part of a professional group. Uh, and, you know, as, as Guy's talked about in his own work, um, you know, antiquarians are sort of at, at that sort of liminal uh, space um, at the point where scholarship becomes professionalised and you begin to get history departments and anthropology departments and sociology departments. And, and I, I find antiquarian a useful term to think about those enthusiastic amateurs who are really actually really good at what they do, but aren't part of that life of the modern professional scholar. I think that, I think that's how I would, would describe that. Um, but Andrew was more interested in what people at the end of the 19th century might have understood by the term. Yeah, I, like, in, in some ways you can actually see this period as the point where things turn, because um, the term antiquarian and the term archaeologist are often used interchangeably. An archaeologist is the more modern professional term to antiquarian, but it's interesting in the prospectus to the Ulster Journal of Archaeology, Bigger and Young clearly state that the people who contribute to the journal, journal must appear as archaeologists, as people who are committed to the scientific study of the facts that are presented by the past in order to bring up an interpretation of the past. And, and you can, you know, at, but at the same time, they will describe the contributors as, as antiquaries. So you're, you're getting, you know, I think this period is, is precisely the period where you're beginning to get the change in the language that's used. Uh, an antiquarian becomes associated with something that's a bit old fashioned, whereas archaeology is associated with something that's a bit more modern and scholarly. D does that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. The Royal Irish Academy still uses the category of polite literatures and antiquities. It's one of its classifications. We have another question online. Yeah, yeah, Margaret, if you want to unmute. Um, Margaret, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Hello, Margaret. Hi, thanks very much for a fascinating paper. Just to go back to the questions that were asked earlier about women. Uh, a few minor points. I suppose if you think of the two young women, Alice Milliken and Ethna Carberry, who set up the Shan Van Bocht in 98, would you think it's true that they are using a lot of the kind of material thrown up within the pages of these antiquarian journals and repurposing the history acquired for them in different ways? And then another point of women, I suppose, Wondering about what happened to Bigger, you know, after 1911, mm -hmm. if you look at his correspondence with Alice Stopford Green, I think you do see the extent to which he seems to feel uh, or, 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 or read between the lines of some of one's uh, one sided correspondence. You get a sense of um, him quieting down and becoming more nervous and less willing to mm -hmm. express his opinions. And on a third point on women, um, I suppose, do you think it's the case that some of the women vaguely associated with these circles, people like Ada McNeil, OK, that's kind of through casement, yeah. but he was at the centre, the Brook women, some of the young women, all of those women were kind of learning Irish and to some extent was their way of uh, emancipating themselves as women going against some of the practices of their brothers or husbands. I mean, there's a few points that occurred to me uh, on different aspects of women in relation to uh, your fascinating paper. Thanks so much for it. No, thank you, Margaret. I, 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 I take 
Um, I take all those points. Um, your first point about sources, absolutely. Um, you know, just as Yates and, and people like that used the, you know, the the publications of various, you know, archaeological societies, you know, to inform their own work. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the female uh, writers of this period are using that those same type of of, of sources uh, as well. Uh, McNeil um, is one of the. You, your question reminded me that uh, she did contribute an article uh, to the um, to the journal. Um, I think it was about uh, prehistoric remains in County Antrim, uh, off the top off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right in terms of the sources. I think um, your point about the decline of confidence, as reflected in the the Stockford Green uh, correspondence uh, by Bigger, I think is I think is is I, I think is absolutely right. Uh, like Bigger is is a fascinating figure and somebody needs to do a really good biography of Bigger uh, because he, he challenges all sorts of, of, of stereotypes, uh, but he's also a deeply complex uh, individual uh, himself. I think it's, it's also interesting from, from what I've gathered from um, his relationship with uh, Stopford Green, they both share, uh, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, they both share uh -huh. quite an antipathy to all things Ulster Scottish, um, you know. There is there, some truth in that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, like there's, there's a very strong sense that you know the the English in Ireland, yeah, we can sort of get behind them, but it's these Scots with their angular ways of looking at things that are potentially the problem, um, which is interesting as well. Um, the the idea of, of of scholarship as emancipation as well, I think, is is a, a really helpful one. Um, I, I, I'd be interested to know how that works in terms of the Millikans, uh, of Seton Millikan and his daughter Alice, because um, my reading of their relationship is that it's actually one of of, of sort of like mutual reinforcement and support rather than necessarily, yeah. you know, sort of um, a, a, any sense of tension. Would you would you go along with that, Margaret? I would. Yeah. I mean, the only difference, I suppose, is after his death and in the 1930s. She's in a very awkward position, but that's more to do with her relationship with her brothers, I think. I think oh, her right. relationship with her father was always a very equal one. You know, right. he was very respectful of her and her interests and maybe even her choices, you know. But okay. I, I, I think and she was so I think she was completely economically dependent on the brothers. OK, no, that, that's very, very helpful. Thank you for those points, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Any other questions? Uh, uh, just the bigger and Presbyterianism has uh, one of the biggest contributions was one on Jeremy Taylor's Church at Ballandary. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure from memory he avoids mentioning anything about Taylor and the ejection of the Presbyterian minister in the 1660s. And on the subject of bigger and the Temple Patrick sessions, big edition by Latimer. I uh, wonder if you mentioned that that second, well, part of that session moved after the hiatus, when no no entries were put in of the 1660s, begins that there was a hiatus because of the persecution of the prelates. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, he, um, yeah. Um, no, big, bigger, bigger tends to ignore things like that um, uh, in, in that regard. Um, and it, it does, you know, in, in some ways, it, it it speaks to the continued salience of those intra-Protestant divisions. Um, um, there's a very fine article by Richard Holmes in Parliamentary History, um, no relation by the way, um, in I think 2022, where he talks about the political implications of this. Uh, and going back to, to Colin, your point about opposition to Carsonism, you know, in, in East Ulster, where there's a Protestant majority, the electoral contests in the early, in, in the first decade of the 20th century, between Presbyterians and the Church of Ireland Protestants is, is really quite visceral. Um, and, and it speaks to the continued significance of that. So I think in some ways that's a bit of a background to read what, what Biggers um, yeah. is, is on about at this point. But yeah, and you, and you mentioned he was associated with St. George, who by that stage was already identified with yeah, it, 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 I, I'm interested in that because Margaret's point about him losing confidence. Yeah. But there is, I'm not entirely sure what happens to 
to Bigger because he is one of the prime movers in the formation of St. Peter's yeah. in North Belfast. Uh, but then he sort of like disappears in 1909, 1910. And then the next I can trace of him is he's attending St. Anne's and St. George's in the 1920s. And I'm not entirely sure what happens to him in between because there's there's an odd reference in the Irish Presbyterian to Bigger's change of ecclesiastical home, mm. which might suggest that he might possibly have been attending a Catholic church. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, that's why we need somebody to write a biography of Francis <laughs> Joseph Bigger. <laughs> I'm not that person. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Oh, anything else online there? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, thank you all for, very much. It's been a really interesting session. Uh, can we thank Andrew for sharing his fresh research with us today? <laughs> we look forward to seeing it published and Sometimes in the future. <laughs> Sometimes in the future. <laughs> Sometimes in the future. <laughs> we're, better, we're better than that. This is not replacing. It's not replacing. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>